All right, let's go to our sermon for today. I want you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Mark, chapter 8. Mark, chapter 8. And I'm going to read verses 31 through 34 as we get underway. Mark 8, verses 31 to 34. And he, Christ, began to teach them that the Son of Man, meaning himself, must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If you're familiar with the Bible, that is, if you've ever read it at all, um, you should recognize this section as the parallel account of Matthew's gospel, Matthew 16, and then later Luke chapter 9. Uh, in all three gospels, the Lord Jesus asked his disciples, whom do men say that I am? They said, thou art Elijah or Jeremiah or John the Baptist resurrected or one of the prophets. Then he asked, but whom say ye that I am? Peter spoke up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. In Matthew's account, he mentions that Christ said to Peter, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And for at least 16, maybe close to 1,700 years, the Catholic Church has interpreted that to mean that Peter would be the rock, or the very first pope, upon which the church of Jesus Christ would be built. That's Matthew 16, verse 18. But if you're honest, you have to admit that if Christ was giving Simon Peter preeminent authority over his church and to his successors by uh, extension, he didn't exactly say so. And so the interpretation of the Catholic Church is still disputed to this day. One of the most sound principles of Bible interpretation decided to jump out at me, finally, just a few years ago. I don't know why it took so long for me to see, but it's the interpretation of two or three witnesses in order to establish something that's true. Paul says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. It's such an absolute principle. It's, it's iterated eight times throughout the scriptures. I'll give you those references if you want to take notes today. You can read them uh, later on. But if you're taking notes, Numbers 35, verse 30, Deuteronomy 17, verse 6, Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, Matthew 18, verse 16, John 8, Verse 17, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1, Hebrews 10, verse 28, and 1 Timothy 5, verse 19. Old and New Testaments. The Roman Catholic Church needs to produce two, or better yet, three plain texts from the Bible to support the idea of the papacy. They have yet to produce one. We're simply asked to believe their private interpretation about Christ's words, which Peter himself w warned against. 1 Peter 1.20, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Moses sang this song, Deuteronomy 32. He, God, he is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. If Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh, then he is the rock upon which his own church is to be founded. So the Roman Catholic 
church doesn't have even one plain text to endorse themselves. But notice there are three testimonies in Matthew 16, Mark 8, and Luke 9 by Simon Peter that Jesus Christ is, uh, that Christ, or Jesus rather, is the rock, the Christ, the son of the living God, excuse me. We believe that. We agree with that. And uh, shortly after that, we have this text that we just read this morning. And there are at least two testimonies in the scripture that Christ called Peter Satan. And they're recorded in Matthew and Mark's Gospels. See, why is that significant? Well, because the writer of this book, Mark, is the same one we identify as John Mark in Acts chapter 12, verse 12. Peter's in prison, and God opens the gates, and Peter walks out in the middle of the night, free to go, and he goes straight to the house of John Mark and his mother, where all the believers were gathering, praying for Peter. Undoubtedly, everything Mark learned about the life and the preaching and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, he learned directly from the mouth of Simon Peter. And Peter must have said, Christ called me Satan because of my rebuke of him. And so Mark includes it in his gospel, just as Matthew did. But Peter evidently said nothing about him being elevated to the papacy. Mark didn't write a single thing about that. Neither did Luke in his account, Luke chapter 9. But uh, if Peter had become the visible head of Christianity, the very first pope, he was awfully quiet about it. That's because it never happened. That's because it never happened. But the verse I actually want to call your attention to today is verse 34. Let me read it again. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I want to be known as a follower of Jesus Christ. I hope you do. Sometimes the word follower can have a negative connotation. It all depends on who you're following. Since the development of uh, Twitter, you hear that word follower a lot. If you send out tweets and people read your tweets, they're called followers. If you're on Facebook, you don't have followers, you have friends. And the more friends or the more followers you have, the more important or the more uh, influential you're thought to be. But of course, it's all artificial. People are stuck on themselves these days. You're not that important. But I mention that because I think there are a lot of people in the world who would like to be known as a friend of Jesus Christ. They admire him in some way because there's really nothing about him you can't admire. But how many real followers are there of the Lord Jesus Christ today? The Apostle Paul talked about some Christians, he says, who have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. 2 Timothy 3, verse 5. And so I call this sermon today, Following the Leader. Following the Leader. And point number one, I want you to consider our leader. Our leader is naturally the Lord Jesus Christ. He's called the captain of our salvation, Hebrews 2, verse 10, like a military commander. The world says too much of a good thing can become a bad thing. But there are some good things you can never get too much of. You can't pray too much. Most Christians pray too seldom, too little. You can't read the Bible too much, as if you want to learn it. And you can't offer praise to and for and about the Lord Jesus Christ too much. As if, if you claim to believe in him. The Bible declares how that God, quote, anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him, Acts 10, verse 38. And we talked about some of this last week when I preached on what's so special about Jesus. The Bible says, And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people 
that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, they were crazy or mentally um, unsound, and those that had the palsy, they were paralyzed or crippled in some way, and he healed them. Matthew 4, verse 24. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Christ was in all points tempted like as we are. And then he adds, yet without sin. Hebrews 4, 15. Christ not only conquered temptation, but he conquered creation. In John 6, he took five loaves and two fish that one boy had, and he blessed it and used it and fed over 5,000 men, plus women and children who might have been there, with plenty of leftovers. That's an amazing thing. <laughs> Read the story. How many? 12 baskets full of leftovers. Later, he defied gravity and the laws of physics by walking on top of the water on the Sea of Galilee to the disciples in their ship. John 6, verse 19. On another occasion, Christ was asleep in the ship, and a storm began to uh, develop on the Sea of Galilee, and the water, the Bible says, came over the side into the ship, and the disciples panicked, and they woke up Jesus, and the Lord Jesus says to the, the storm, Peace, be still. And suddenly, the storm ceased. And the disciples asked each other, what manner of man is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. He not only conquered temptation, he not only conquered creation, but he also conquered afflictions. He spat on the ground and made mud or clay of that and put it into a blind man's eyes who had never seen. And he told him to go wash it off in the pool of Siloam. When the man came back, he was able to see for the first time in his life. John chapter 9. He came upon ten men who were afflicted with leprosy. And those men were commanded in the law of Moses to keep their distance from the general public and declare themselves to be unclean uh, to avoid anyone getting too close or having it spread or the, the risk of contagion. But they cried out to him for healing, and with just one word, Christ healed them all. Luke chapter 17. Christ healed the lame. Christ healed the lepers, the cripple, uh, and those with mental impairments. And on at least three occasions, the Gospels tell us about he raised the dead back to life. The widow of Nain's son, they're carrying this young man on his way to the burial spot. And Christ touches the cart or the beer. They were carrying the man on. The man gets up. He went to the uh, uh, chief ruler's house whose daughter had just died uh, just a brief time before he got to the house. And he says, um, Talitha Kumi, that is to say, a maiden arise. And she gets up. Back to life once again. And the most famous case, of course, the raising of Lazarus. Lazarus, his good friend, had been dead and buried four days before Christ came to the tomb. And he yells to the tomb, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man came back to life, bound with grave clothes. And Christ said, loose him and let him go. Jesus Christ was victorious over affliction and even victorious over death. But his words moved the multitudes as well. He had multitudes, thousands of people following him every day, hanging on every word he uttered. The Pharisees were jealous. The Bible says Pilate knew that for envy they had delivered Christ to be crucified. They didn't have anyone following them that way. No one was hanging on their every word, waiting to see what new doctrine or teaching they would offer. When he read the scriptures in the synagogue, Luke chapter 4, verse 22, and offered comment, the Bible says, And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. When he preached the 
Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, probably the most famous sermon ever preached in the history of the world. We read at the end of chapter 7, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The apostle Peter said about Christ, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, Second Peter or 1 Peter 2. Verse 22, the officers were sent to apprehend Jesus. They came back empty-handed, John chapter 7. And they said, never man spake like this man. But the Lord Jesus Christ is our leader. He's the one we want to follow. If you can find me someone better than the Lord Jesus to follow, I'll follow him. But until you do, he's the one I want to be a follower of. Has there ever been... A better example to follow? No. There have been some great leaders in the world. There have been some great military commanders who inspired their troops, inspired the men underneath them, um, and those men were willing to do whatever that commander, whatever that general told them to do. That's how much confidence they had in him. But none like the Lord Jesus Christ. None ever like the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's a leader who deserves to be followed. Secondly, I want you to consider the journey. Consider the journey. If you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you should know what you're getting into ahead of time. He said in our text, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. It may not be an easy life to follow Jesus Christ. Uh, To turn to Jesus Christ as a true believer Who's want, who wants to follow him, uh, involves living by faith. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. He said, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Matthew 8, verse 20. We forget that the Lord Jesus Christ lived uh, homeless, depending on the kindness of others and wherever he went to sleep. Paul wrote, having food and raiment, that's clothing, let us be therewith content, 1 Timothy 6.20. If you have food and clothing, thank God for that. If you own a home or even rent an apartment, that's icing on the cake. That's even more than you ought to expect as a follower of Jesus Christ. So you can see right away why a lot of people say, I'm not interested in that kind of life. I'm not interested in trusting God with that much faith, or depending on God with that much faith. I don't think I can muster that much faith. You can't. You need him to help you muster it. You can't even bring forth or call forth enough faith to trust in him without his help. That's the amazing thing about Jesus Christ. You need him for everything. But... He said, um, or most people forget that the Lord Jesus lived homeless. Uh, it's also a life, uh, rather a journey, of humility. Christ told his disciples, and us by association, But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and ye are all brethren. Matthew 23, verse 8. Verse 11 there says, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Romans 12, verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. It may be a journey that includes rejection and uh, ridicule as well. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Matthew 10, verses 35 and 36. Your family may despise you. They may cuss you out. They might think you've lost your mind when you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you have been raised in a very strict religious setting, a lot of tradition, a lot of formality, a lot of customs that have developed in that sect or that denomination for many years, and you finally get a real dose of salvation... 
and the forgiveness of God by the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, this satisfies me in a way that all of that never could. You might not put it in those words. You might not ever say it exactly that way. But when you no longer are interested in the old religion your family raised you in, that's what they hear. That's what they'll hear by your actions, your rejection of that, and your desire to live for Jesus Christ. That's what they'll perceive. That's how they're in, they'll interpret it. And then anyway, I despise you and hate you and say, well, you think you're holier than we are? And the truth is, yes, I am holier than you. I've been regenerated by the Holy Ghost. I have the Lord Jesus Christ living inside of me. There's a mansion in heaven waiting for me. I'm going to be glorified and made like Jesus Christ one day. So, yes, I'm better than you. But you see, you can't say that. You can't say it to them that way. You can't talk to them. You love them. You pray for them. You try to be a testimony and an example in front of them whenever the opportunity is there. And if God opens the door to you for you to talk to someone about Jesus Christ or witness to some loved one, then you walk through that door and you take every advantage of it that uh, he provides. But it's a life of humility. It may be a life of rejection and ridicule. You might even have to turn your back on your own loved ones in order to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. He said, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, verse 37. Those are difficult words to accept. Those are difficult conditions to, to live under. And you can see why it's not popular to say I'm a true follower of Jesus Christ. People think you're some weird religious nut if you follow Jesus Christ. No, you finally get your eyes opened. You finally see the world and, and heaven and hell and eternity as they really are. You see the greatest need for man is to be born again. It's not something physical. It's not something that can be supplied by the outside world or the physical senses. It's something spiritual that needs to take place between you and God. If you're saved and you want to follow Jesus Christ, would you cut off loyalties to your own family members if that was the only way you could be devoted to live for Jesus Christ? In order to be closer to him. If that is what was necessary, would you be willing to do that? Could you do that? There are many Christians find the life of the dedication and consecration and self-denial too miserable to uh, continue. They become worldly. They stop following Jesus Christ as closely as they once did. And it's very unfortunate. But following Christ can be a difficult journey. Uh, thirdly, let me say this. Consider the destination. Consider the destination. The Lord said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. John 14, verse 2. The Bible says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. And verses 51 to 53 in that chapter say, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're hoping for. That's what we sing about. That's, that's what we pray about. And we want to see it. Amen. We want it to come true. Right. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18 state, For which cause we faint not? For though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, our light affliction, that's what Paul calls it. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 
while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Romans 8, verse 18. Peter tells us that God has saved us, quote, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1, verse 4. Revelation 21, verses 23 and 24. And the city, New Jerusalem, had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb, that's Christ, is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And verse 27 says, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. I'm glad my name is in the Lamb's book of life. And if your name's in there as a believer, it's in there with permanent ink, and nobody can, nobody can erase it. Now, let me begin to close. When the Lord Jesus told Peter and Andrew, his brother, both fishermen, follow me, Matthew chapter 4, we're told, and they straightway left their nets and followed him. When he called James and John, the sons of Zebedee, also fishermen, the Bible says, and they immediately left their ship and their father and followed him. When he came upon Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, the tax collector's desk, uh, collecting money from his fellow Jews. And he said to him, follow me, Matthew chapter 9. We read, and he arose and followed him. The disciples left their former, former occupations, and in some cases their own family members, in order to follow Jesus Christ. We can consider our Savior. Our Savior is great. He is beyond compare. The journey, however, might be grueling, very difficult. But the destination is glorious. Amen. Unlike anything you could conceive of. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. And I want to be the friend of the Lord Jesus Christ, but not just a friend, but a follower. Amen. 